first hand, and I'm sure everyone in this room would agree, that the session that was led by UCAS just then, and actually very selfishly, I'm glad that we've gone straight after them, there is a growing gap between access to universities full stop, but especially competitive universities. And I think that the session that we're going to share with you today is just going to share some of the actual tangible research. I know UCAS kind of touched on it. They had a slide that was dedicated to like the widening gap, especially when you look at the most competitive universities. But um, we're here to share some of our work. Um, now, it's going to be about a 30, 40 minute session. There'll be some time for questions at the end. If you don't have any questions throughout, please, please do. Quite like sessions like this to be informal. I know this looks quite formal with a microphone and me standing at the front. But yeah, hopefully um, any questions, we can get those answered. So. just. The mouse, uh. Great. So um, when we were designing this session, we were trying to come up with a name that we think kind of neatly encapsulated um, the work that Zero Gravity ca carries out. Now, just a really quick show of hands. Is anyone in the room familiar with Zero Gravity? Have you heard of us? Great. It's kind of good that we've got so many new faces. Now, um, the reason why we entitled it kind of the network advantage is I'm going to talk you through some of the research that we carried out through our Gap Zero report. And essentially, at Zero Gravity, we are all about identifying talent from low opportunity backgrounds and propelling them into their next steps. Now, for most of our members currently, and I'm sure we're seeing the trends actually are coming through that a lot of really high potential low opportunity students are really seriously considering apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships, which is amazing. But for lots of our members, that is getting to a top tier university. OK, now we use the term top because that's what our members determine as top. But generally, that's a UK top 30 university. And you're going to hear me banging on quite a lot this session um, about this statement that's on the board. I'm sure everyone in the room is super, super familiar with this. And that is that talent is spread evenly across the UK, but opportunity isn't. It's still depressingly the case that your postcode determines your potential at both kind of university access, potentially career access as well. And in fact, we've got some research to back that up too. But we're essentially, this is kind of our guiding mission statement at Zero Gravity. It informs everything that we do. Every single decision we make comes back to this. Is it going to help level the playing field? Now, the session is kind of structured as follows. We're going to quickly just walk you through what the network advantage actually is. Conscious that for some of you, this might be a new term. And actually, it was something that came up in our research and something that we really want to share with you. We're then going to share some of the findings of our Gap Zero report. It was actually carried out last year in partnership with one of our universities um, and some of the kind of key findings that I think really validate why we're all here today. Um, we're then finally going to show you how Zero Gravity membership is trying to combat that network advantage. And I'm also really keen to hear from your context, try and make this as engaging as possible, um, how some of these strategies might apply and also any strategies that you're currently using and um, how we could potentially share those as well. But I thought we'd just start because I want to try and make this as interactive as possible. This statement on the board, does it resonate with you? And I suppose what I mean by that is in your context, in your sixth forms, in your colleges, like where do you see this on like a daily basis? I don't know if anyone's keen to potentially just share some thoughts. Where potentially do you see like talent actually not matching opportunity? Because it's all well and good us standing up here and sharing this, but quite keen to hear from anyone in the room. Yeah. And that's super hard, right? If geographically there are kind of like borders and boundaries. I think, again, the interesting slide from the UCAS session before us, London, once again, all the opportunity is there. Interestingly, HE access is great there. And actually, like your, your geographical proximity to opportunity is a really good way of viewing this statement. Um, we're a totally free tech platform. And the reason why we've decided like a digital first approach is that we don't want to not be able to work with a school in the northeast. We don't want to not be able to work with a school in rural Shropshire. OK, because we believe that actually opportunity should be for everyone, regardless of your background or your postcode. Any other thoughts, potentially from like a uni perspective as well? I think we've touched on careers. Has anyone else got any anything to share? I don't want to put anyone on the spot this early in the morning. Yeah.
yeah so you find that students are kind of staying close to home because potentially that's what parents want yeah interesting I actually jotted down that we've had more the second highest number of disadvantaged 18 year olds secured a place at uni you cashiered amazing right but only if talent is realized and opportunity is realized right so for example if you've got parents and by the way in no way am i saying that parents shouldn't be doing this they obviously have their best interests of their child at heart but if you've got parents that are potentially guiding those university choices and that is restricting their potential that's something that we're really really keen to at least ensure our members make the most informed choices possible um, and i'm going to share you as to how we do that in a second Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to quickly um, walk you through the network advantage first. Now, we thought we would kind of create a bit of a, I don't know what you call this, like an image or an analogy, but essentially the network advantage is all about how socially mobile talent, and that is students from low opportunity backgrounds that have demonstrated the potential to fly, whether that's at university, through an apprenticeship or through a graduate career, they are consistently losing out in their journey. Now we see that really clearly when it comes to top university applications and we're going to share some research that backs that up the problem is it then compounds at a graduate level as well so if you're a super talented student from a polar quintile one area potentially and you've got your site set on a top uni potentially oxford ppe is really what you want to study but no one in your immediate network has been to oxford no one in your immediate network even knows what ppe stands for Already, you've got a massive hurdle in front of you when it comes to accessing a degree and an institution that you're more than capable of getting into. Now, unfortunately, when you drill down, and Oxbridge is an interesting example, right? Like the graduate outcomes for those that attend Oxbridge are pretty impressive. So if university is that first blocker, and in fact, like your access to networks is so crucial in, in determining whether you can get in, we've got a massive problem. Not just because it's unfair, but like as a society, we're losing out on so much talent that could be taking up those places. Now, what actually is the network advantage? We essentially came up with this phrase because it quite neatly encapsulates the intangible advantage that's obtained through a broad professional network. Now, Professional naturally kind of gets you thinking about like careers and we're going to talk about how this impacts careers because it's massive from a graduate career perspective, but also networks that can support with uni applications as well. So let's just take the journey. If you're a state educated pupil, just like we've explored there, you've got your heart set on a great university, a competitive university, there are quite a few hoops that you need to jump through. If you don't have immediate support that can talk you through the difference between a campus and a city university, explain what a collegiate uni is, you know, then start the whole process of, right, okay, this is what a supercurricular is, by the way, and how does that differ from an extracurricular? Because actually they are very different. Personal statements, interviews, potentially admissions tests, like we're not even at kind of university level yet. And there's lots and lots of hurdles that are preventing school age talent from realizing their potential. Let's imagine they do get to university, of course. We've just heard that we've got the second highest number of disadvantaged 18 year olds getting to university. Unfortunately, the network advantage continues. OK, we've got thousands and thousands of university members across the country and they keep telling us, I don't know how to get an internship. What is spring week? You know, I really want to break into finance because that's where my passions lie. But unfortunately, there are forces working against me that are stopping me from breaking in to that elite career. So essentially, we wanted to do some research into this. We had a good idea that this existed. You know, obviously, we talk as educators all the time about the growing gap between private and state. We wanted to actually do some research into it. So I thought I'd just share some of the key headlines for you just to kind of start some discussion. Now, we in 2022, uh, we we saw some, a university to complete some research for us. Um, and that was called our Gap Zero Report. We're actually in the process of commissioning a new and updated version. But essentially we had a pretty cheesy tagline, which was, please mind the education gap. And essentially this research, I think validated everything we've just discussed. Okay, it is still the case that if you are from a low opportunity background, the odds are stacked against you if it means that you realize your potential. Now, what were some of the things that we found? 
we looked at a whole range of factors and I'm going to walk you through actually we segmented it by school uni and career access but we actually I wanted to share with you just from like a, a wealth perspective in fact, we share this with our members occasionally and naturally talking about like earning potential and income, like real tangible things can definitely prick people's ears. But we found that the top 1%, and I'm sure this is no surprise, of private school students earn an average of 180 grand a year. Now we then compared that to the top 1% of students on free school meals and their average earnings across their lifetime was 63,000 pounds a year. Now, if you just like let that sink in, it's pretty clear like the inequality that's happening here. And this isn't because there's a talent issue. You know, this isn't because students born potentially in a household where they're eligible for free school meals aren't capable of breaking into a top uni or a top graduate career. It's unfortunately that it's just the way the UK is structured and organized, they're being held back. We also found that there was 185% difference at age 30 in earning potential between private and state. So when you think about like the impact that earnings have on your lifestyle choices, where you live, the flat, the house you live in, okay, these are pretty, pretty important things. Now, unfortunately, this network advantage compounds, okay? We know all about like the kind of compounding effects of interest and how that can really make your money work for you. It does the opposite thing from a network advantage perspective. If you don't have access to application support, you know, if you've got financial concerns about going to university, OK, you might potentially not put in that application for a university that's far away from home. Right. Such a classic example. Now, in not realizing your potential for a university that you should have applied for, you then potentially go to. A uni oh. It's not the place, but <laughs> this way, it's, I think. I didn't realize that was a humorous but, um, but yeah. Uh, this compounds at uni, right? The imposter syndrome that so many of our uni students and members experience, especially when they're looking at graduate careers as well. Finally, this ends up with a really, really weak talent pipeline going into the best graduate internships and graduate opportunities. OK, so it's got a compounding effect. Now, acknowledging this, we want to do something that starts right at the beginning of this journey. I'm going to talk to you about how we support schools and colleges with their sixth form talent, but we've got to get it right at school age because the effects are compounding and the more it compounds, the more unequal society becomes. Now, just from a school perspective, um, we researched into kind of like imposter syndrome, you know, that feeling of not feeling that you're welcome or that you, you should be there. And students felt they often don't belong due to imposter syndrome. That's students from low opportunity backgrounds. In fact, 24% of socially mobile students won't apply to uni because they don't think they'll get an offer. We then asked working class students how many people they knew that studied at Oxbridge. And we found that 58% of working class or low opportunity students didn't know a single person who had gone to Oxbridge versus a private school pupil that knew nine. And when you put into perspective the compounding effects that those networks have on A, the private school pupil being like, I think I can do this. You know, I think Oxbridge is for me. And you know what, if I don't get it, at least I've given it a go. But then also, I think Oxbridge is for me. And I know nine people that have recently taken up a place. OK, so think about the network advantage that that is giving to those that were just fortunate enough to be born in those circumstances. Final thing, private school students are three times as likely to report receiving more than 15 hours of individual support with their uni applications compared to state school students. Now, the thought of 15 hours for every single pupil is just impossible, right? Um, but unfortunately, this is what we're working with. This is what the private sector is giving. We then looked at uni students and compared to private school students, low opportunity uni students, that state school students that took up a uni place, were seven times less likely to know a banker or a politician. Now we have over, I think at last check, seven and a half thousand uni members and banking and finance is naturally a really popular industry and sector that our uni students want to break into. But again, you don't know someone that's recently navigated that really, really challenging application process there's forces that are working against you, especially when it comes to securing internships as well. There's also a higher rate of attrition. Socially mobile students are four times more likely to give up a place at uni because of the cost of living. And this is only growing, right? We again just heard from UCAS that this is a growing issue. And of course it is. And finally, students from state schools are 31% more likely to have a part-time job 
at uni versus those that didn't go to a state school. Now, one thing that we do at Zero Gravity is kind of acknowledge this is we, we are a tech company for a social enterprise, but alongside that tech company, we've run a charity. And what that charity does is it raises money from high net worth individuals that want to ensure that students from low opportunity backgrounds don't face financial barriers at university. And we essentially deploy scholarships. I think so when we last checked, we are one of the largest UK scholarship providers for students from low opportunity backgrounds. And essentially we give them £3,000. So long as they engage, it's our most engaged and most disadvantaged year 13s. We give them £3,000, £1,000 per year on a zero gravity preloaded card. So they can spend it on whatever they want. No strings attached. And again, this is our way of ensuring that your background doesn't determine your potential. Final, final thing. Appreciate this is a lot of info. Careers. And I think this is super, super important because it's all well and good. We support thousands and thousands of students to break into top universities. But actually, that's kind of the first part of the hurdle, right? Realistically, setting them up for success is ensuring that they can break in to a top graduate job as well that recognises their talent and potential. Now, we found that despite efforts by many employers to reform recruitment practices, elite graduate careers are still dominated by Russell Group graduates, with 81% of legal trainees coming from those Russell Group institutions. I think Durham has, at last check, 55% state school students at that university. If you look at like how many actually attend private school in the UK, they're massively over-indexing on private school pupils. Right, and they're doing a lot of work to combat that. But if law has a pipeline from Durham and 55% of that pipeline are privately educated and have those networks to help with what is a very competitive application, again, the odds are stacked against our state school members who want to break into a great career in law. In fact, that is the stat that I was referencing that's next. And finally, students who attend Russell Group universities earn on average 200K more over their lifetime. And in fact, if you attend Oxbridge, you earn over 400K more. So we're working with some, hopefully some real tangible data that is justifying that like, obviously talent being everywhere, but opportunity not is deeply, deeply unfair. Now, what we're hopefully aiming for is equity, right? We're trying to combat that network advantage. And I'm actually gonna hand over to you in a couple of minutes to talk in your pairs. Like, what are you doing? And I'm sure there's loads of great work going on in your context, but like, what are you doing to, I suppose, combat this? Um, but essentially, our kind of aim, our mission, is to ensure that every single student from a low opportunity background can realize their potential. I'm gonna explain how we do that in a second, but this is what we're aiming for. A way bigger proportion of state educated students reaching providers that best suit their ambition. And we collaborate with employers to diversify their recruitment pipelines and remove traditional barriers. What does that mean in actual practice? We work with HSBC, one of our flagship employer partners. HSBC really want the best diverse talent. Okay, they really, really do. Their values really align with ours. But what we found is that we work with them on a mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring support. And I'm gonna talk you through how all of that works. And we found that actually the drop off rate for zero gravity members was less psychometric testing. OK, so many of our members kept dropping off. And what is honestly a test that, again, if you get loads of support from someone that's recently navigated a psychometric test, you might even have someone that sits at the laptop and completes it for you. Of course, we're going to see a big disparity in those from low opportunity backgrounds winning great graduate positions at HSBC. So we're actually working with HSBC to drop that element of the application process. OK, and actually, this is what we want, right? Through our research and our thought leadership, we want to try and work with graduate employers to diversify their pipeline and remove barriers that were previously holding back really great talent. So appreciate that was loads and loads of info and a lot of talking from me. And um, I thought I would hand this over because Whenever we deliver sessions like this, usually they're a little bit more informal. And I'm always really keen to hear what great practice is happening in your context. You know, that might be, for, for example, having like an alumni program where former students come in to support with things like this. It might be having one to one sessions for students that are potentially applying for more competitive unis. But I thought I'd just give you a couple of minutes to talk in your pairs, the real teacher in me coming out. Um, does this resonate? And if so, like, what does it actually look like? in your context, this kind of lack of access to networks. We're then gonna come on to what strategies do you have in place to kind of combat that? Yes. Um, I, I don't remember there's any sort of studies that have been done on, because I do think that there is also an onus on the 
as well. There's so much work that goes into getting students from um, disadvantaged backgrounds into university, but once they get into these top universities, why is there still a gap? Like, if, I'm just curious as to what those, you know, like once those students are in those universities, what programmes are there to then support those students with their destinations as well? I think there's absolutely work that we should be doing, and, you know, organisations like yourself are great as well. But yeah. You need to come as well. 100%. And, and we actually partner with you. The reason why we're here is because we formally partner with Leicester, because Leicester are doing amazing work in that space, but also want like a digital solution to that as well. So what we're doing with Leicester is we are essentially identifying low opportunity talent at undergraduate level at Leicester, and we're pairing them with mentors in their kind of dream industries. And they've got access to masterclasses. We'll go through kind of how we actually do all of this stuff, but I think it's a really good point. Um, but yeah, so much work still needs to be done. Cool. So go on. Yeah. So I kind of go, it's lovely, but it feels, and I don't mean to offend, almost it's a little bit of a token gesture. You're able to say you're doing all of this to help, but actually is it really helping? Yeah those in financial deprivation. 100%. In no way are we saying that our £3,000 scholarship is the silver bullet for solving this problem. I think actually we find that firstly our scholars is what we call those that receive our scholarships. Uh, not only receive that £3,000, no strings attached, but also get way more extra support from a employer partner perspective. There are just exclusive opportunities for those scholars. I think their A-level grades were on average like A-star, 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 A, you know, like super, super talented but just don't have access to opportunity. I think another thing we do is we try and kind of uh, amalgamate, I suppose, other scholarships that are available for students that potentially qualify for ours. It's very likely they'll qualify for others. But I totally agree with you, we're not a silver bullet. One thing I will say is that we hear from our scholars, if it wasn't that scholarship, I wouldn't have got the iPads that I use every single day in order to complete and engage with my course. We also did a bit of research into how many hours of part-time work, 3,000 pounds saves. I think it was about 160 hours of part-time work. So I totally agree. It needs to be part of a way bigger program of support, but we're, we're hoping that at least it's making a bit of difference um, and hopefully just releasing some of that pressure. Cool, really keen to hear your thoughts. So everything I've just spoken about, kind of want to hear, like, did it resonate? Is it something that you kind of acknowledged? And what does it look like in your context, firstly? So I'll give you just a couple of minutes to talk with people on your table, and then I'm quite keen to hear some thoughts. Thanks. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Just quite conscious of time. Time really flies when you're having fun. Um, just building on that, a second question that hopefully will um, just progress those conversations. Great if you're experiencing this in your context, right? I'm sure lots, especially if you don't have like immediate geographical proximity to opportunity, I'm sure you're feeling that you resonate with this and hopefully that's the case. Really interested here, like what strategies do you have in place to combat it? 
Okay, we hear from our schools and colleges all the time that they're doing such amazing work to try and combat this. And it actually inspires us to think about how we can innovate as well. Um, so again, just kind of two more minutes, like what are you doing to combat this problem that you're recognizing in schools? And then we'll, we'll hear ideas. Thanks. Okay, amazing. Um, quite keen for us to hear some thoughts, just so that you can potentially share some good practice. Take that away to your own context. Is anyone up for sharing? I suppose the first question was like, do you see this in your context, this challenge? And then secondly, like, what are you doing to combat it? Because in you know, already the first conversation I've had, there's some really, really great work that's happening at the front. Um, so would anyone like to share their thoughts? Yeah. Wicked. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Well, I suppose the beauty of London, right, is you can jump on a tube with a class of twenty. Um, I think TfL even give you free tube travel for educational visits. So, definitely. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Yeah. 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 And the power of compounding, right? Like that's your first pilot year of doing it. Once that becomes baked into your provision by year 10, you know, think about the impact that will have. I also know Melton Vale, I think they're local to here, run an excellent alumni mentoring program as well. Might be one to check out. Yeah. 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 
hundred percent. We actually were in a school in Stevenage a couple of weeks ago and we were asking students to set up a LinkedIn profile and they had no idea what that even meant. And actually they left the session with an active platform with a really cool little title. They were like expiring solicitor and then they were starting to reach out, you know, make some connections, which is great. Yeah, final point. Yeah. Once we put that out to our wider teaching network, as they do, mm. we managed to get some really great links to do sort of one to one interview practice with them on specialists within that subject area. So that's proved really useful. Absolutely. And again, that word networks came up, right? We work with Brampton Manor. I don't know if you know them in London. I think they send more kids to Oxbridge than Eton or something like that. And what was really palpable when we went in to visit is that like so many members of the team knew someone that could help with engineering, you know, that, that specific interview, knew someone that could help with land economy. And it was all coming back to networks. And that kind of takes us quite nicely into kind of the final part of the session. But I did just want to quickly um, ask that final question. As a former teacher, I know my answer to this question, but I thought just finally, I wanted to ask the room, have you ever benefited from mentorship? Because it's something we're going to be talking about um, in detail in a second. From someone in your broader network, just kind of think about who that might be. Um, and potentially someone that's potentially outside of a professional network. I know obviously as teachers, you do have to have like an NQT mentor, et cetera. Um, but yeah, is anyone up for sharing? Potentially a mentor they've benefited from in their professional network? I can start. Uh, my mum was a teacher. Um, so when I told her that I wanted to become a teacher, firstly, her eyes lit up, but secondly, had loads of support, let's be honest, with the application process. Um, and that absolutely improved my chances of winning a place on the Teach First programme. I think that's a really just easy, clear example, totally through my circumstances. You know, if I hadn't have had my mum, then I'm sure I could have found an auntie and uncle, someone that could put me in touch, right? But again, if you don't have access to those networks, life gets a lot harder. Now, just because of time, we'll move on. But hopefully what we've been talking about today um, has at least just kind of got you thinking about the problem. Now, at Zero Gravity, we are an incredibly ambitious mission-driven mission organisation that essentially is on a mission to ensure every single student that is from a low opportunity background has access to those networks. And not only has access to networks, but is able to realize their potential. Now, how do we actually do it? We are building the UK's largest peer network of socially mobile talent, breaking down access to uni, careers, internships through tech. Now, to date, we've supported over 8,000 students from low opportunity backgrounds into highly selective unis, including 800 into Oxbridge. We ran a quasi RCT independent study with UCAS, essentially just validating, or at least it's a, a study that is meant to validate whether zero gravity membership has an impact. UCAS found that zero gravity members are 39% more likely to win a place versus non zero gravity members as comparable applicants. In fact, your chance if you're applying to Oxbridge double if you're on the zero gravity platform. We're on our way to supporting 20,000 students this year into top unis and careers. And to date, we've deployed over £1.5 million worth of scholarships to our most engaged, most disadvantaged year 13s. And totally agree, that is not the silver bullet. But hopefully this kind of suite of opportunities can at least give them that extra step, that extra push. Now, how do we actually do it? We work with schools, but we work with 750 partner schools now. We've got members at over 1,400 schools. It might be that you have a student that is accessing zero gravity that you just don't know about yet. But essentially what we do is we work with year 12s. It's kind of like the sweet spot, naturally. The earlier we start, the more impact we deliver. And we welcome them to the platform, so long as they're eligible. We do have some eligibility checks. It's worth caveating, kind of standard WP eligibility checks. Once they're welcome to the platform, they gain kind of three main things. The first is access to an undergraduate one-to-one -one mentor who's studying their desired subject at their desired university, has recently navigated the application process they're about to embark on. So let's imagine you've got stumped someone in your school context that wants to apply for maybe like history at uh, Leicester or potentially um, at UCL. We can pair them with 
a current undergrad studying history at Leicester or LSE or UCL. And through weekly mentoring sessions, they'll double their chances of winning a place. They also gain access to masterclasses. I think we've had some comments about how unis could do a little bit more. What we do is we bring in unis to speak to our members. Elliot Newstead is a really good example. Uh, spoke to our members a couple of months ago, head of student recruitment at Leicester, to break down what Leicester are looking for in a great personal statement and top tips to ensure you're submitting your best application. We work really closely with Oxbridge. Dr. Matt Williams is our kind of legend, low-key legend admissions tutor, who comes in and delivers inside in exclusive insights and inside scoops for our members that they're putting forward their best application to Oxbridge. Now, once they're at uni, we don't stop there because we know that's the first hurdle that's been completed. In the exact same way we paired them as school students to mentors, gave them access to masterclasses, and they joined a digital community, the exact same thing happens at undergraduate level. So let's imagine that same student that really wanted to study history at UCL gets in, amazing, but then wants to break into law, we can pair them with a legal professional that's recently navigated the application process. It's a few years ahead of them. And again, through weekly mentoring sessions, HSBC, HSBC validated this, we double their chances once again. Now the dream is at every stage of this journey, we're creating a community that is not only receiving support, but is dropping the ladder behind them. So we talk about alumni networks, and I think it's really important that schools have their own. But what we envisage is that we're gonna create a community potentially 50, 60, 70,000 school students that are going to university every single year, who are mentoring school students behind them in their footsteps, whilst also gaining access to professional support at the same time. That's the kind of vision, and we call it our kind of one platform, one journey vision. Now, we talk about zero gravity membership because we hate the term like disadvantage, we hate the term low income. But if you think about it, would you ever identify yourself as disadvantaged? Probably not. So we use the term low opportunity. And essentially, we use that term just to ensure that our members actually feel really quite empowered by that feeling. Okay, low opportunity is actually, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case for you actually seizing that gap. So essentially we put ambition before disadvantage and membership before intervention. We're a brand that's built around defying the odds, okay? Trying to, obviously zero gravity, that kind of metaphor, trying to defeat those gravitational forces that are pulling you down. And we find as a result, our members are super engaged, really, really are driven, are super ambitious. And through that, we're creating a super powerful network of socially mobile talent. Now, conscious of time, just because we've got about 10 minutes and I'm keen for us to get into some questions. Final thing, how do we actually combat it? Now, we work with schools all across the country. I was actually saying earlier, Northampton Academy is one of our most engaged schools. I think to date, they've logged over like 400 free mentoring hours with our undergraduate mentors. Um, a really good example of a local school that is using zero gravity, we're totally free by the way, um, to improve destinations. We've got members at over 1,400 schools across the UK in six forms and mentors or undergraduate members at over 110 unis. And as I mentioned, we formally partner with universities like Leicester to ensure they can help us with our mentor supply. But in return, we can help those undergraduates break in to their dream careers. Now, as I mentioned, we're totally free. And essentially what we do is we give our schools access to a free school dashboard. And that dashboard allows you to refer students to us that you think would benefit from the platform. You then can download resources like our virtual assembly and um, that allows you to launch Zero Gravity. And then crucially, you can evidence the impact that Zero Gravity is delivering for your sixth formers. But hopefully you found the session helpful. I'm gonna be here all day. I'm gonna be at the exhibition stand as well. Um, if you are interested in working with us, we actually did have a QR code that I don't think has come up. Um, but you can head over to um, zerogravity.co.uk. I think I will put up the, sorry about this. this is... If you think that we can help, if you think that we can be part of your kind of like baked in provision for your six formers, then please do head over to our website and express interest in working with us. We're totally free. We'll never charge 
our schools and their students. And the reason why is because we charge it our employer partners later down the line who want the best, most diverse talent. And through that, we can keep everything free for our schools and students. But essentially, super, super easy process. Head over to our website at zerogravity.co.uk forward slash schools. Express interest in working with us. You'll very quickly then just be invited to activate that free school dashboard. You could realistically, if you did that today, by Monday, be referring students to Zero Gravity and they could be eligible for the platform within a couple of hours. Um, so really, really, it is very low effort, high impact, hopefully, on your side. Um, but that is it. I just want to reiterate, thank you so much for making it. And um, we've been blown away by the kind of interest and support. If you do have any questions, we've got about eight minutes. So we can definitely go through some. Yes, at the back. A hundred percent, of course, students want in person. Um, transparently, we're a tiny team. And we work with schools across the UK. So at the moment, we can't do in-person launches. One thing that we can do is if we are working with your multi-academy trust, we do MAT partnerships. I don't know if you're part of a MAT, um, but we can at the moment explore in-person stuff, not launches, but like potentially like careers days. Um, but at the moment, we can't commit, unfortunately, to in-person um, our partner schools. Um, that will change, I'm sure. And in fact, we're currently exploring, it's an active discussion, in-person launch days like en masse for students across the country uh, where they can also get upskilled and hear from those are really great experts. But at the moment, we can't um, commit to it. Yeah, yeah. So what we do is we do virtual launches all the time and um, virtual launches happen across the country every day. And um, we've got like a pre-recorded virtual assembly that you can play. That is basically the same session that we would deliver via Teams or Zoom. If you think that actually you'd rather have it live so we can answer some questions as well, just get in touch. We can absolutely facilitate that. No problem. Hey. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah, it's it's a really, really good question. We we are always thinking about how we can better improve our assessment of eligibility. We do have an extenuating circumstances form which captures any kind of naturally extenuating circumstance that might fall out of street level postcode data. Occasionally, if a school emails us with a particular student that isn't captured by extenuating circumstances, isn't captured by their postcode, but has gone through loads in their life, we can potentially, using their professional judgment, make a manual adjustment, um, but we can't do that en masse. Um, but yeah, hopefully, I think the way we assess eligibility is good for now, and we're always looking at how we can improve it. Thanks. Yeah, the back. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Really important question. I think the first thing to really emphasize is what kind of distinguishes us from other mentoring kind of initiatives and platforms or in-person support is that we've essentially built proprietary technology that has safeguarding principles built in at its core. So the example you shared, a student makes a disclosure. We have in the top right hand corner of any call or message, a report concern button. And what that does is it immediately freezes the match. It alerts us as a designated safeguarding team to look into it and we'll do, we'll follow our process and our policy. And um, but that will often involve communicating to a school that something has been shared. Honestly, it's often like mental health, stress, naturally, you know, especially year 13s that are applying for competitive unis whilst balancing their A-levels. And actually schools are really grateful for us sharing that. Um, but we've got lots and lots of steps in place. Another example is after every single call, all of our members have to rate out of five how it went. Um, anything less than four, we look into from a feedback and monitoring perspective. Anything less than three is a concern for us and we look into from a safeguarding lens. To date, we've logged over 50,000 hours of calls. They've been rated on average a 4.8 out of five. Um, and where it's not a five out of five, it's generally through a technical issue, which is sorted. So generally our school student members really feel the value of those sessions, but it's something that we're always, always improving and working on. Hey, one more call. Mm. Uh, 
to lots of students that you know they've got that application and again they still sit at that cusp of they probably might, may well not take it up because of the power of the, the family supplication and actually we'll try really hard to get them on board that this is the best thing for their young person but that young person is often an income provider in yeah. the household and if they go so it's just you know what support is there with them to send that link sounds wrong but you know yeah. kind of help them break away from what's keeping them really really challenging right i don't think we've yet got an answer i think one thing that we do do very well is put our members into community spaces where they're engaging with like-minded six formers that really have their, their heart set on a great ud we also put our members in front of really great masterclass leads and i think in doing so what we're doing is we're like slowly raising expectations you know we've got members that come along to every single masterclass led by an oxbridge admissions tutor that the compounding effect of that is that actually every time their expectations are slowly raising and um, but we don't yet have an answer to how we can sever that link but i do think being part of our community our members report that their expectations of themselves really really raise um, and i think that's why our community is so special to us and um, because it's a real force for change and movement thank you so much for coming along and um, really really appreciate your engagement and your time i'm going to be up in the exhibition stands and um, if you do want to come and chat to me please please do but please express interest in working with us if you're potentially interested and we'll hopefully welcome you to our school community soon thank you The lecturers like coming in after. <laughs>